Hello everyone, it's 1 p.m. Eastern and that means it's time to begin another of our monthly Kokoros Weather Talk webinars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Henry Regis. Joining me on our program today is co-founder and director of Kokoros, Nolan Duskin. Behind the scenes running the technical side of our program is Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from the Colorado Climate Center here at Colorado State University in sunny Fort Collins, Colorado. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we'll be recording it today for future viewing on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by grants from NOAA's Office of Education and the National Science Foundation. Well, today's webinar, we're going to take a look at forensic meteorology. That's all about weather detectives for those of you out there. Uh, you may have watched the TV show CSI. Well, it's a little bit like that. And we're excited to have with us today Pam Knox. Pam is one of our Kokoros Georgia Regional Coordinators, been with us for a while, and a certified consulting meteorologist at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Pam has a degree in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin has, and has worked in fields, the fields of uh, weather and climate for over 30 years. Her previous jobs include work with the National Weather Service Office of Hydrology, uh, she has served as the Wisconsin State Climatologist and as the Georgia Assistant State Climatologist. Pam is now working for the University of Georgia as an applied climatologist teaching extension agents about climate variability and the change and Im its impacts on agriculture. Uh, in addition, Pam has worked as a certified consulting meteorologist specializing in expert testimony since 1998. Uh, and she served as an expert witness in over 60 cases involving some aspect of weather and its effects on people, vehicles, and property. Uh, that's some interesting stuff there. Pam, welcome. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Thanks, thanks for being part of our webinar. Thank you. I think it's going to be a fun, fun talk. Do, do you have a favorite uh, case that, that comes to mind? Uh, maybe you can share with us briefly? Well, I, or? I have a lot of stories about cases. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to talk about just one. And, you know, they're favorite for different reasons. Although I have to say, one of the cases I'm going to talk about, my husband and I call it the beaver case. And we just think it's funny that it's all about a beaver and, and the weather. So you'll get to hear that a little bit later in the program. Oh, that, 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 that sounds really neat. OK, we'll take it away. And we'll come back and join you uh, when you're finished uh, with questions from the audience. Thanks, Pam. All right, that sounds great. As Henry mentioned, I do a lot of different things. And I have done a lot of different things over time. But one of the things I do sort of in my spare time is uh, to be a friend. And you can see, uh oh, my screen just went black. There we go. Um, you can see that I am also listed as a certified consulting meteorologist. My license number is 587. That means there's a bunch of us out there. And so um, that um, is something that's very useful to have as a forensic meteorologist, but it's not required. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we move on here. And I think my screen's being a little slow here, but we'll move it along. Let's see, Henry. I don't know why it's not moving forward. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. Noah, are you are you on? Oh, now it's it's just slow. I think we okay. got a new we got a new internet system yesterday, and I think we haven't quite adjusted to that yet. So here we go. Uh, what is a forensic meteorologist? I think in the questions that you were asked when you signed up, we asked what forensics was all about. And I think most of you got the idea that forensics is about um, trying to figure out why something happened. Um, in general, a forensic meteorologist uses uh, weather data or climate data to determine the impact of weather on accidents, crimes, and other things. And you'll also see at the end that sometimes we use it for other purposes as well, besides just looking at, at um, real incidents like that. But anyway, it's the idea is that something happens, uh, usually something bad, because if it's good, we don't really care about it that much from a law uh, perspective. And we have to take a look at what caused that. You know, and in most uh, accidents or other events like that, it's really a whole chain of events that happens. It's not just a single thing that happens, but often the weather is the first thing that causes the chain of events to happen, and that can cause uh, problems such as rain falling, making the surface of the road slick, and that causing vehicles to lose traction and uh, then sort of cascading on from there. So what does a me for forensic meteorologist do? Um, 
usually we have to identify the chain, uh, the location of an event, and often that's given to us by the lawyer that would consult with us. Um, but you still have to go in and figure out what the latitude and longitude are because often they don't know that, and that becomes important when you're looking at things like uh, radar analysis. Um, it also helps to kind of get the feel of the lay of the land sometimes. Of course, here in Georgia, where I'm from, it's usually fairly flat, but it can be important, especially in certain parts of the country where you've got a lot of topography. And since I'm a meteorologist, almost always I determine what, what weather was occurring, and then I have to go in and acquire weather and climate data for the time of the event and antecedent times. Antecedent's a big word that means the times leading up to um, the accident, because often the weather that happens several um, hours ahead can be important in looking at the accident, sometimes even longer than that. Uh, often we'll review reports from police, engineers, and witnesses just to see what they say about the weather. You have to be a little careful with this because they don't always report it correctly. You know, most of these folks are not necessarily trained meteorologists, and usually they're a little busy at the time, especially if it's the police responding to the accident in real time. And so they can't always give you uh, correct information, but you have to look at it and see what they say. And then often we prepare reports on weather conditions, that that would be something that you would testify about in, in court if it gets to that point. And then there's a whole legal procedure that you go through. You start out uh, by providing this report, talking to the lawyer, and then usually the, other, the lawyer on the other side wants to find out what you know, so they will depose you. And then uh, based on that, they may decide to try to settle the case, or they may take it all the way to trial. And so I have testified in trial. I would say of the 60 or so cases that I've ever been deposed in, probably only five of them have gone to trial. So lawyers certainly are interested in settling. But to do that, they really need to know what the situation is. Well, how do you become a forensic meteorologist? It really helps to have a wide range of weather and climate background. You've, you've heard from Henry that I've done a lot of different things in my life. I started out as a physics major and a math major and then jumped into meteorology because I like to know what's going on outside the, w the window. And so I've done a lot of different things. I probably have not specialized very much in one area at all, except for maybe uh, looking at climate data. It's also good from the standpoint of um, testifying in court if you have an advanced degree, like a master's or a PhD. And it's not necessarily required, but it's something that a jury is going to give more weight to if you have an educational background to that. And then often, um, you're going to testify in court, it helps to have the certificate as a certified consulting meteorologist. And that is um, something that is provided through the American Meteorological Society, which is the number one professional society for meteorologists in the country and probably in the world. And so they do a certification process um, that I'll talk about in just a minute. Again, this is something that's not necessarily required, but it's usually a good idea to have the additional credentials because the jury will certainly give uh, whatever you say, more weight if they understand that you have, uh, you know, a, a good background in the field. Certified consulting meteorologist. This is another question that we asked about um, in your questions when you were when you were signing in or registering, and I think most everybody got it. Uh, certified consulting meteorologist does says that you have some requirements that allow you um, to to really be able to demonstrate that you have good credentials and good background in meteorology. Um, when I started out as a certified consulting meteorologist, you had to have 10 years of experience in the field. They have now reduced that down to five. Um, but so you can't just jump in right from graduate school. You have to have some experience so that you can sort of start to get an under, a feeling for what's going on in the field and get some actual um, work, work background. And uh, that really helps you to, to be able to explain uh, what's going on because you understand it better yourself. As part of the certification process, there's a long written take-home exam. Usually they give, you, they give you something like 25 questions and you have to pick 20 of those to answer. They cover the entire field of meteorology. I was surprised at the variety of questions that were asked. Uh, and you're given a few months to complete that and then you send it back and it's uh, evaluated by a board that includes a bunch of certified consulting meteorologists and they also help write uh, the, the test exams for that. If they think you've done well enough, then they send you on to the next stage, which is to do an oral defense of your written exam, where basically they ask questions about, especially some of the questions you didn't get quite right, and we talk about that and try to figure out, um, you know, what you were thinking when you answered the question the way it did. And you also have to provide evidence of competence in technical writing, 
um, because so much of the work that forensic meteorologists do is written, they want to make sure that people are able to communicate well in writing. And of course, you know, it's anytime you do a license, you got to pay a fee, and so you pay a fee to the American Meteorological Society. Now, CCM is a, is a certificate you get once, and then you um, renew it every five years or so. And for renewal, you just go in, and there's a certain number of points you get for seminars or for doing expert testimony, uh, for taking classes and uh, reading journals and things like that. So you have to really keep up in the field. It's not just a one-time thing. What I want to spend most of the time today talking about is some of the court cases that I've worked on in the past. And I should say that none of these are current cases. These are all older cases. But I think they're all kind of instructive in the kinds of things you have to look at when you're doing forensic meteorology. And I'm going to start off here with a, a train crash that happened in May of 2003 in Hinesville, Georgia, which is just to the southwest of Savannah. Um, you can see the pictures there. Uh, shows the train um, really sort of jackknifed. Um, a lumber truck came up a side road and uh, stopped and then started to cross the track and uh, didn't see the train coming for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. But um, the train was going down to the southwest at about 70 miles an hour, and the engineers saw him, but of course, you know, it's not easy to stop a train, and so they were not able to stop in time, and they hit the, the lumber truck. And so the issue became, whose fault was it? So here's a little, little diagram that shows the background, and I think you can probably see my cursor on the screen here. The north is to the top of the picture. The train tracks are this line here that's going from northeast to, towards the southwest, and the road that the lumber truck was on is this road here. It's a gravel road um, that comes in and straightens out just as it gets to the track. This is a crossing that did not have any lights or gates or anything like that, so it really depended on people to look up the tracks and figure out what was going on. And some of the issues that were involved in this were, of course, the weather, because the weather will affect things like visibility, uh, light conditions, at the time of the accident, this occurred at about 7.20 in the morning. And uh, the, the way the driver behaved was an issue. Did they behave responsibly? And the way the engineers behaved, were, did they behave responsibly in this issue? As I said, it's never, or it's very seldom just a single factor. It's usually a whole bunch of factors that all interact together. So once I get the location, I knew where that was, the first thing to do is to look for weather information. And of course, you know, you almost never find a weather station right at the accident. It just doesn't happen. Um, even if there was one there, you wouldn't necessarily be able to trust it because you don't know the, of the maintenance. Uh, so you can sort of see the orientation here. Savannah is up not too far from the coast. And here's I-95 going down and I-16 coming across. Um, the train went to the southwest, and the accident is noted here by the arrow in red and the, the symbol A. And there's really three stations that had weather data, um, especially this had to be hourly data because the time of day turned out to be very important. Um, those were Savannah and Fort Stewart and uh, Midway, which is a, a site that's run by the Forest Service in Georgia. And so, again, you know, this accident happened at 720. Most hourly observations only happen once an hour, usually about 10 minutes before the hour. So you have to sort of look at what's happening between uh, data points. And so Savannah at 6.53 in the morning, it's daylight time because it's May, and at 6.53 in the morning it was 72 degrees and the dew point was 72, which means the humidity was 100%. So we know that there was a lot of moisture in the air. The winds were very light, only 3 miles an hour, and visibility uh, says 6 miles an hour. BR is a symbol which means blowing rain, but it also can mean mist. And in this case there was no rain happening, you could tell that by the radar. So that was just very misty conditions. An hour later, the temperature had gone up just a degree. Um, dew point was still at 72, and the winds were calm. So whatever was forming was staying pretty much in the same spot. And at Savannah, the visibility had cleared up a little bit. At Fort Stewart, um, same basic temperatures at 658, 72 uh, with 72 dew point. So again, 100% relative humidity and variable winds. Uh, Visibility is six, six miles, but, you know, it's, that just sort of gives a general feeling for what was going on. And by an hour later, the temperature had gone up a little bit, but so had the dew point, so it was still really close to saturated conditions. 
and Midway had very similar weather conditions. So it showed that the weather across the area was very uniform. Now that's important because then that gives you a higher confidence in those, those uh, observations representing what was going on at the accident site. There are certainly other times where you have a front in the area or you have uh, spotty thunderstorms or something where you can't really believe that. But in this case, the consistency of the observations gave us a lot of confidence that we knew what was going on at the accident site. This is my little hand-drawn um, diagram from, from using an old Yahoo map. They look a lot better now, but at the time, this was what they had. You can see there's the, there's the train track. Here's the gravel road that's coming down. The star is where the accident occurred. The train was moving from the, southeast, or from the northeast towards the southwest at 70 miles an hour. One of the things that I had to look at was what were the light conditions like at the time. And it, you know, at 7.15 in the morning, the sun's usually not very high in the sky. And so one of the things I looked at was where is the sun? And this time of year, uh, it's after the, the equinox, so the sun usually rises a little bit to the north of east. And you can go and find astronomical tables that will tell you where that was. By doing that, I looked and found that at 7.15, just about the time of the accident, or maybe a couple minutes before, um, the sun was at a height of seven degrees above the horizon. So that's pretty low on the horizon yet. And it was at an azimuth of 75 degrees from north. And I've done my little hand-drawn sketch here in red, which shows 75 degrees from north. So here's the sun shining down in this direction. And one of the things I noticed when I looked at that was, you know, if that trucker was looking up the the tracks, he was going to probably be looking almost directly into the sun. Now, I don't know about you, but when I am driving down the road and I'm looking into the sun, the sun's low in the sky, it's really hard to see. And so that was a, something that I had to keep in mind. I, I thought this was a very useful diagram. Unfortunately, they did not take it in court because I'm not a trained um, expert in accident reconstruction. And so my little hand-drawn sketch was very useful for me, but because I'm not certified as an accident reconstructionist, they wouldn't take this in court. So, you know, just because you're an expert in one field doesn't mean you're an expert in something else. Well, of course, you know, if the, the sun angle is important, but if there's clouds, it doesn't really matter that much. So I, the next thing I did was to look at the clouds. And these are some satellite pictures. They're visible pictures. And there's a little red cross here which shows the accident site. The first picture was taken at 7.15, the next picture at 7.45. And you can see there's this really interesting feature in the clouds, this dark area here which represents, I think, an area where there were no clouds. Um, so at 7.15, just about the time of the accident, the site was still in clouds, but very shortly thereafter, this dark area with no clouds uh, was moving towards the southeast. You can see here it is on one side of the accident, and half an hour later that, that area has moved on the other side of the accident. Really, if, if you look at a longer time uh, loop of what's going on, you can see that area is moving down uh, with the upper level winds across the area. So it seemed very likely to me, based on looking at satellite pictures and understanding uh, how clouds move over time, that there was a period of time that lasted about half an hour where it was probably you know, not that many clouds. It was certainly enough so that the sun could peek through. And uh, you know, we don't have a picture at the exact time of the accident. In fact, they're not sure to the minute when the accident occurred. Um, they have a pretty close pretty close estimate of that. but uh, So to me, that was another factor that had to be taken into account. Uh, there was a witness. Here's the train tracks again. Here's the road. And there's a witness in the house just to the northwest of where the accident occurred. He was walking outside of his house about 6.30 in the morning. And he talked about this in his deposition later. And when he was out there in his yard, you can see there's not a lot of trees there. It's fairly open. Um, he said there was fog in the area, and the fog was gradually getting higher, which is, an, which is something that happens a lot with fog uh, in the morning. If you ever watch, there's often ground fog at the, at the surface, and then as things warm up, that fog gradually rises up and dissipates. So he said at 6.30, at least, there was fog in the area, it was near the surface, and it was drifting sort of to the north. And so um, there was no observation from the other side, but if we say that that conditions were generally even across the area, that we feel pretty confident if there was fog uh, at the observer's house, it was probably fog in the other surrounding areas as well. There was another observer, or there was another witness who crossed that track about 7 o'clock, and he didn't notice fog. So you have to kind of weigh both and see, you know, who do you believe? Was, did he not notice fog because there was none? Um, did he not 
pay attention? Was was he listening to the radio or something like that and, and not really um, noticing? Or was it spot, the fog really spotty? And that is a question that we cannot answer. So, you, so the jury in the case has to go in and weigh all that, and so does the expert. What I concluded was that you know if you look at the weather conditions across the area, the relative humidity was almost 100% relative humidity. So it was really juiced to, to have fog form if, if the conditions were right. We know that at least one observer saw fog in the area, and it was layered, so it was probably um, probably rising because it was starting, the sun was up, it was starting to warm up. And we also noticed that the sun was located almost directly in the direction that the truck driver would have looked when they were about to cross the tracks, and that there was probably an opening in the clouds. So what I think in this case was that um, the truck driver probably dr came to a stop at the track, looked up, um, tried to look up the tracks. It was pretty foggy, so it was hard to see, especially if you've got light from behind fog. It's, it's very difficult to see that. Um, was not able to see it, and of course, a train going 70 miles an hour would be really hard to see um, from any distance at all. And that's a long ways to go, even in a second. And I think if the, if the sun came out just at the right time, it may very well have blinded them and uh, was not able to see that. Now, if, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the train engineers, of course, they're looking with the sun behind them, and they would probably have been able to see this truck very clearly and see that it stopped and then started moving, and then, of course, not being able to do anything about it because of the speed they were going. And so um, there were some other issues in the case as well about whether or not the train engineers blew the whistle, whether people could hear the whistle, uh, if that would have made any difference or not. It's not clear. And I. I believe, I didn't testify in trial because I believe they eventually settled the case, but there were a number of parties that were involved in this case. But you kind of see the whole process that a forensic meteorologist has to go through. You have to identify all the, the possible uh, factors that are involved in a case like this and then try to put them all together in a way that makes sense. So I thought that was a really uh, interesting way to do that. A second case that I looked at was a hydroplaning case on Interstate 75, and all these are are cases that I did in Georgia, which is why you're seeing all the Georgia examples. Um, this is in South Georgia. You can see here's Tallahassee, Florida on the map. The border is in the dotted line here. Um, Valdosta is just down here a little bit. This is to the north of Valdosta. And there was a, a, a Terminix truck, a tank truck that had chemicals in the back. I was traveling north on I-75 near Lenox, Georgia, and it hit a patch of water on the road. and lost traction and ended up crossing the median and uh, hitting an oncoming van and killed the driver of the van. So the question was, was that rain expected? Was it able to be drained off the road? Um, you know, were they behaving responsibly? Did they have any warning ahead of time um, that was, that was going to go on? The driver, when I talked to the driver, the driver survived. He said that it just started to rain heavily and that he was driving around the speed limit. Um, but there was traffic, and so he tried to pass a semi-truck, and as he switched lanes, he lost control of his truck in the puddle and slid across the median. Um, and so he said, well, there's just, you know, I was going the speed limit, and there's just no way to, to do anything with it. So, so some of the issues involved with this accident were how much rain fell, when did it fall, um, why was there water on the road? Was the road not built properly so that it wasn't draining properly? How fast was the truck going? And what condition was the truck in? And all those things had to be taken into effect. Obviously, not all of those are the meteorology conditions. Again, it's usually not just the weather, but it's the weather in combination with other things that are acting together. Here are some radar images for the time period of the accident. The one on the left is for Tallahassee. And the one from right is from Moody Air Force Base near Valdosta. They're kind of looking at the same storm from two different angles. Sometimes that's nice to see because then you can see um, if there's any effects of the radar looking at different angles of the storm. So if you can do that, you kind of like to kind of like to get a feel for what's going on in both places. The accident is shown. Accident site is shown here as the little circle on the interstate, and you can see the dotted line that kind of falls to that. At the time of the of the incident, there was in fact, they had been driving through some spotty rain, um, but they'd just gone through a clear patch and then they hit what looks like a little thunderstorm cell where there's some moderately intense rain. You know, there's no red in there, so it's not really a high intensity uh, rain, ev rain event, but it's enough rain, uh, so it was falling down at a pretty good clip. 
Uh, there are no weather observa observations near the site, not co-op. Um, this was at a time before Cocoa Ross occurred. Now I'd have to check and see if there was a Cocoa Ross observer. Uh, they have used Cocoa Ross observations in a few lawsuits, although um, some of those probably haven't made it through the courts yet. And they're a little trickier because they're not certified by the National Weather Service uh, with, with official National Weather Service um, equipment and things like that. They don't archive it quite the same way. You know, I mean, the Cocoa Ross guys do a great job, but, but legally, you have to have very strict rules. And if you're going to use a Cocoa Ross observation, often you need to have a certified uh, consulting meteorologist look at it to make sure that you know, it's sighted properly and that they're taking good regular observations. So if you only report once every uh, five days or so, just when it rains, then your report's going to be less useful and less believable in court because they really like to see that regular observation. So th there's a lot of calculations that can go into this. Uh, rainfall rates from radar are calculated using something called the decibel or the, or the, the log Z equation. I'm not going to go into the details of how you calculate it, but basically if you've got a decibel level of 40, which amounts to a, a light yellow on the radar maps here, uh, 40 is about half an inches, about 0.48 inches or about half an inch in an hour. If it's 45, which is the, the darker yellow there, uh, sort of a goldenrod color, then that would be about one inch per hour. And for 50, which is the darkest of the colors, that's about two and a half inches per hour. Now, you know, keep in mind, it's not necessarily raining for a full hour because these storms are moving, but that's the intensity, uh, which that would be what would happen if that storm stayed in the same place for a full hour. And as you get higher and higher up on the uh, intensity curve, that's not so useful because the radar just gets saturated. Some of the new radars are actually a lot better at being able to do this, but at least the radars at the time of this incident um, really could not be used for more detailed information than that. Now, when you're doing that, you know, one of the arguments from the other side is usually, oh, well, this was an unprecedented rainfall. We couldn't possibly have foreseen it or designed a road to, to withstand it. And so you have to use something um, that talks about intensity, duration, and frequency. Um, in Georgia, the standard has been to use something called the Georgia Stormwater Management Manual. And the storage, they have uh, these tables for different parts. This one happens to be for Valdosta. That was the nearest station to the area. And it tells you for a rainfall period of five minutes up to 24 hours um, how often a rain of a certain intensity would occur. And uh, a lot of these standards uh, vary from one state to another, so you always have to know what's going on in your particular state. The standard used to be something called NOAA Tech Paper 40, which was published in 1961 and had data only going up to that point. It was just updated in the last couple of years. Uh, it hasn't really made it through the courts yet, I don't think. So, so this is still the standard for designing roads. And you know, if you're a civil engineer, you might go into that and say, well, if I have to design for a 10-year storm, which is a storm that happens on the average once every 10 years, uh, then I need to be able to design for the system to be able to remove a certain amount of water in a certain amount of time. So by going in, we can look at um, the, the peak rainfall, if I go back, you can see um, based on the Tallahassee radar, we're probably up at close to 50 uh, decibels there. So about 2.5 inches per hour. And if we go to the return periods, this is for a one-year return, which means something that happens on the average once a year. Um, 2.5 inches is below the uh, return period for a, a half an hour of uh, 2.89. So that shows that this rain was certainly not an unusual rain at all. It was very ordinary, something that happens probably a couple times a year. Um, and so any claims by the other side to say, well, this is something that was unprecedented, um, it just really doesn't hold up, in this case, in court. Now, by comparison, the rain that they had uh, yesterday in Islip, New York, you know, they got 11 inches in about three hours. I don't, I don't know if we had a Cocoa observer that caught that. Um, and about 13 inches in all. Something like that is much rarer, and if you went to a, a technical report like this and looked at it, you'd find that that was well over a 100-year event. It's very rare, although those events seem to be increasing as, as we go on in time. Pam, we, we did actually have somebody right, right dead center with over 13 inches there. Wow. Well, good for them for going yep. out there and measuring it. So I didn't, I, when I looked on the chart earlier this morning, I didn't see it, but I didn't look carefully, so good for them. 
And you know, we all I think as Kokoraz observers, many of us live for those kind of high intensity rains. They're much more exciting to measure than they are the zeros, but both are important. So in this case, uh, when you started to dig into the uh, information, it shows that the engineer um, noted that the drains were overflowing, but that the puddles were not on the road themselves. They were off sort of on the shoulder. And they found out by interviewing the employees that the employees had actually gone to their boss that morning and said, you know, these tires look pretty bald. Maybe we should get them replaced. And the boss says, no, we don't need to do that. And so they were out driving on bald tires, and they hit this patch of rain and uh, probably were driving um, over the speed limit, at least when I drive on that interstate, almost everybody's over the speed limit, uh, including myself, and uh, certainly driving too fast for conditions going into that rainstorm, and they'd lost control of the car, partly due to the bald tires and partly due to the speed and, and the water. Um, they did have someone look at the drains, but it looked like the drains were um, okay. They, they were overflowing a little bit, but they were not encroaching on the road. So as long as you stayed in the road, it should have been okay. Um, so again, you know, again, you have to look at a whole series of things. You look for data. If you can't find an observation right at the location, then you look for radar because radar gives really good aerial coverage. Um, and you try to figure out how that, how that storm ranks and look at it in terms of an engineer. Now, you know, once the rain hits the ground, usually I don't, I'm not an expert at that point. So then they would hire a hydrologist or somebody who studies the movement of water on the ground to do that part of the analysis. So I give them information about um, the rain, and then they go in and do their analysis based on that. The third case I want to talk about is what I call the beaver case. Um, the name of the hydrologist in this case was actually name, his nickname was Bucky Beaver, and which is a, it's funny. The, the whole case uh, revolved around a beaver dam. And, you know, we have a few beavers in Georgia, as there are in many other parts of the, of the country. And the beaver dam had um, been built near the road, and it caused water to back up over the road near Carsonville, Georgia. This is sort of in center Georgia, just a little to the west of Macon. Uh, the car was driving down the road about 7.30 in the morning and hit this water and hydroplaned it slid off the road and went into the, the beaver pond and unfortunately the, the driver drowned in that case. So the issues were, you know, the, the amount of rain that fell, um, how much rain had fallen before that because you needed to know, you know, how long did it take for that beaver pond to fill up, and then also the condition of the culvert that was really controlling the drainage from that area. In this case, um, I used observations from the National Weather Service co-op stations surrounding the site. Again, this was 2003, so it was before Kokoraz, although we don't have as many Kokoraz stations here as we'd like. Uh, you know, we could always use more. Um, you can see some of the variety of rain events. Whoops. The nearest uh, station, which was about 10 miles to the southeast, had about 2.3 inches. Uh, the next nearest, which was in the other direction, had about 2.7. And then there were, there were amounts that were hard, larger, but they were off to the northwest. So you couldn't really say that that would be representative of the conditions there. And when I originally looked at the data, the, I would have wanted to look at radar, but unfortunately the National Climatic Data Center, which is where the official archives are, had an ingest problem. They were not able to save some of the radar data from that day. So I originally had to just use the observations because that was not available. And then in the course of the um, investigation, another map came uh, to light. So, so here's some of the factors that were in this case. The Georgia Department of Transportation claimed that the culvert was cleaned out earlier that week, which is an interesting claim because, you know, there's probably thousands and thousands of culverts around the state, and it's interesting that they managed to clear out that culvert just, just that week, so there would have been no backup there. Um, they had a hydrologist, a civil engineer, who said that it would have to rain over six inches to accumulate that much water in the beaver pond. And if you remember from the, the observations, there were some that were over five, but they were done over six. So that's a little, little um, questionable. Another thing is the radar, lack of radar data, and then this uh, rainfall information from uh, the, from a meteorologist on the other side that had a rainfall map from radar that showed three to four inches overnight. So we're trying to figure out where that was from. 
And it turned out that there was a research meteorologist that had found a way out of the ingest problem and was able to pull this radar information. So the accident site is listed here in, uh, in red. You can see it's right in the area of heavy rain. Most of the heaviest rain was off to the northwest. So that was consistent with the observations that we saw, whereas other areas farther to the east had less rain. Here, the darkest blue is over five inches, and the green is more like a quarter of an inch or so, and it, grade, it grades along there. So if you look at the radar map from this research meteorologist, the radar estimate of rainfall was three to four inches. You know, it's a, it's a good heavy rain, but it's not six inches. And if the culvert had just been cleared out, it probably wouldn't have been an issue. In that case, what they determined was that, and I, I forgot to put a slide in for this, um, the Department of Transportation logs showed that there was a late entry that was put in in a different handwriting and a different color of ink. And I, I believe that this one went to trial and the jury decided that somebody was falsifying data. And so the rain, the rain itself was not enough to cause the flooding issue, but that culvert had probably built up a lot of um, detritus over a long time period, so they'd had much longer time to gather all that rain together and uh, accumulate it in the puddle. So. You know, there's, again, a case of many interacting factors that are going on there and having to work within confines. I'm not going to spend as much time talking about some of these other cases, but I just want to kind of give you an idea of um, some of the other cases I worked on. And I am not sure why this is going so crazy here, but we'll try to keep the cursor moving. That might stabilize it. Um, I worked on a number of hurricane cases along the coast. And one of the issues that happens along the coast is that there's often two different insurance companies um, that cover either the wind damage or the water damage. You know, they talk about having flood damage or flood insurance to cover uh, flooding, if you're, especially if you're in your low-lying area. And a lot, of the, a lot of the people that were along the coast did not have flood insurance. They had insurance for wind, for things like tornadoes, but nothing for flood insurance. And if you can remember in some of these storms back in, 2004, 2005, there were some pretty significant uh, storm surges that came. These two pictures happen to be from Hurricane Katrina. And you can see, if you look, here's the, the water down at the bottom, and there's like a bathtub ring of debris that occurred um, during some of, these, some of these storms. Well, the question is, um, and the way the law is written, especially in Mississippi at the time, that whichever caused the, the, most, the worst damage first, had to pay for the whole house. And so the question was, was the wind strong enough to completely have destroyed the house or destroyed it enough that it would have been totaled um, before the water washed it away, or if the house was in pretty good condition and then the water came in and just um, really destroyed it? Because that was going to depend on which insurance company was going to pay for it. And you know, it's a hard thing to know because you, you have a house that looks something like this, um, very hard to determine. And so um, I was asked to come in and look at the wind conditions and what you might reasonably expect to see uh, from wind damage to houses. Um, now, Katrina had very strong winds when it was out in the Gulf, but when it came on shore, the peak winds were only 80 to 100 miles per hour or so uh, at most locations, except for a really narrow band where they were up around 110. Um, and usually, if you, if you look at the photographs that they use for tornadoes to determine uh, wind speed from damage, something like that would, would cause a lot of shingles to be taken off, um, maybe blown out some windows, but overall it probably would not have destroyed the structure of the house. And yet we can see even though there's still a lot of shingles left on the roof, the bottom part of the, of the house is just really um, destroyed. And of course wind or water has a lot uh, more force because of the weight of water than wind does. So water can usually do much more damage. This is the same reason why you're not supposed to drive your car into water, because water is so strong, uh, because it weighs so much, that it can really push you along quickly. Some of the other cases that I've worked on over time um, are things that happen. The temperature of a deck surface on an Egyptian cruise ship. Somebody walked on the deck in bare feet and, and burned their, their feet, and so they wanted to sue the cruise ship for not uh, warning people properly. Um, not sure where that one ended up. Wind damage at a home under construction. They were they were doing some uh, renovations and the tarp blew off and water got in and damaged what was inside their house. And so I had to look at how strong the winds were. 
Um, their slip and falls are a very common thing that happens, and they can either be caused by rain and wet conditions, or they can be caused by ice buildup, as you see on the bottom here. And then other cases where visibility in light conditions um, are important because some people might have daylight driving restrictions or things like that, and you have to figure out if they're behaving responsibly, if they're following uh, the guidelines that they're supposed to use. So all those are cases where they would probably hire some sort of forensic meteorologist to figure out what was going on. Now, ultimately, most of the time, um, these do not go to court. They settle. But even before they settle, um, they still want you to come in and talk to the lawyer. So when you're going to serve as an expert witness, and this is true for other fields besides meteorology, but uh, certainly true in the, the fields that I work in, first of all, you have to establish that you're an expert. And to do that, usually you have an advanced degree or you have the, the CCM uh, credential, something that shows that you've been in the field a long time and you know a lot about the subject. Um, you have to show that there's no conflict of interest. The first thing a lawyer will always ask me is, have you been contacted by the other side? Um, or do you have insurance from this company? Um, or you know, do, you, do you have any reason to not be able to answer responsibly? Because they don't want somebody to come in that has a conflict that would keep them from doing their job in an impartial way. So you have to show that if they find conflict of interest, then you would be thrown out pretty quickly and you would not be allowed to do testimony. Uh, you have to show that you use established practices. They don't want you to do anything that's not uh, accepted behavior because it's got to be able to stand up in court. So if you're doing um, something that's a little novel, it's hard to get in. This is especially true in something like medicine where you'd have to worry about um, using some experimental treatment because they don't have a track record and so it's hard to say what the effects of it are going to be. You must use a valid data source. I talked a little bit about um, cocoa rods being used once in a while, but in general you want a source that has got regular um, publication of data, got, has regular um, inspection of the equipment. They're using some sort of standard equipment and things like that. So most often when you're using weather data, in a courtroom situation, you're going to use something from the National Weather Service. Anything else, you would have to have probably somebody go out and do a site visit to see that, that the gauge is not too close to the house, there's no trees growing over it, uh, things like that. So, so you have to be able to justify uh, why you would use that data. Of course, you, know, you want to use what's the closest, but you also want to use what's accurate because having bad data is worse than not having data at all. You also have to be able to get the lawyer to understand what you did because they're the ones that are going to be in court questioning you. And if they don't understand what you did, they're not going to be able to ask those questions effectively. And then you have to be able to explain it to a jury. You know, you've got to keep in mind that most jurors do not have as much background in science as, as I would, for example, as an expert witness. Some of them are great. Some of them really know the, the science well. Um, sometimes they tend to get weeded out when they're picking the, the juries, but not always. And then you have to be able to defend your analysis in cross-examination. Now, I just got back from a, a week-long workshop at William Mitchell School of Law up in Minneapolis where I spent a week practicing this, and we spent time practicing being lawyers and having to ask questions, both uh, direct questions to witnesses and cross-examination questions, questions to witnesses, and I worked with a bunch of law students and a bunch of other atmospheric scientists. It was a very intense week, but it was very interesting because it talked about um, how lawyers really think about the case in different terms than the expert does. And you really have to kind of put both together. In addition to the forensic and legal work that I do, um, I do other consulting work as well. I'm just going to mention this briefly. I, I believe that they have had a CCM talk before on Cocoa Rouse. If not, it would be interesting to have them talk about some of their other work. These are the kind of things that I do. Um, I have done business study on the effect of rainy days on a outdoor sales activity. For example, if you have a car company that has their cars outside on a lot and it rains on a Saturday, how much business do they lose by having a lot of rain or snow? And do they ever make that up? And so I did some work on that. It turns out that they make up probably about half of it on subsequent days if that don't have rain. But they never, if a rainy day is really bad for business, especially if it happens on a weekend. Another thing I did was some work with some utility companies looking at what happens um, to your calculations of degree days, which is something that you might see on your utility bill for heating or cooling. 
um, if you use 10-year averages instead of the 30-year normals that we usually use. So that was another thing I did. That's not court-related, but certainly uh, something that you really need to know something about the data to be able to answer. And then uh, just a final example, which I think is kind of fun, I was asked to um, help a casino company buy a piece of property in Dodge City, Kansas. And, you know, if you've ever been to Dodge City, Kansas, you know they have a lot of feedlots there. This is a picture of a feedlot. You can see there's a lot of cattle, and the cattle put out a lot of interesting, interesting fragrances. And the casino was worried about having some of those fragrances get into their casino and whether they'd have to buy extra super-duper uh, air cleaning equipment to uh, keep it a pleasant experience inside the casino. So here's a map of Dodge City, Kansas. Um, and all the red stars on here are areas where there's feedlots. You can see there's a lot of them, and they're scattered all around the city. So, and there were a number of lots that were there, and they had to try to pick out a lot that was the right size uh, to figure out um, where to put their casino. Well, you got the, the most important thing here is to look at winds. To do winds, you have to have uh, some sort of observation. It turned out there's an airport here on the east side of uh, Dodge City, so the, the airport has pretty good wind observations. And uh, you, meteorologists will often look at something called a wind rose, which tells you the frequency at which uh, the wind blows from each different direction. I'll use the summer example here on the left. You can see that the biggest wedge is wind that comes from the south. Dodge City is always in the middle, and this tells the wind comes from the south in summer most of the time. And that might make some sense. It does occasionally come from other directions, but not very often. And you can see there's some shift depending on the season. In the winter, there's a higher percentage of winds that's coming from the north or the northwest. And that's just the, the larger scale pattern that's showing up in this. Um, it's also broken down by winds at different speeds, which is sometimes important. In this case, it was more the direction than it was um, the speed. So you want to be able to consider that the wind is blowing from the feedlot towards your location, whichever location that would be, and how often that happens. And it turns out that by putting all this together, uh, they were able to find a nice big open spot that they put their casino in. Um, and it's pretty close to one of the feedlots, but if you look at the percent of time, let me just go, go back here, the percent of time that the wind blows from the southwest towards the casino, it's relatively small in all seasons. And so they felt pretty comfortable in putting that casino there, even though the um, even though it was pretty close, just because the winds hardly ever came from that direction. And so that's kind of a puzzle that has to be figured out. There are no lawsuits associated with this, but it was certainly a case where you had to kind of scratch your head and figure out um, what was going on. So in summary, a successful forensic meteorologist generally can work with a wide variety of research topics. There are some that specialize. There are some that work more with aircraft uh, accident cases. Um, but most of them, especially the smaller ones, get asked a variety of different topics. And some of the big forecasting firms like AccuWeather also have forensic divisions that specialize in taking on these cases. Um, almost always a forensic meteorologist has to collaborate with other scientists. Like As I said before, when the rain hits the ground, then I'm not really an expert anymore. And then it's up to the hydrologist to explain what happens to that rain water when it's on the ground. And so you have to be able to collaborate well with other scientists to really talk about um, these, these boundary effects. And you have to know the well-known techniques and a lot of terminology, including a lot of jargon um, sometimes, to be able to explain all this and put it in terms that non-scientists can understand and can make decisions on, because really the jury is all about making a decision based on all the evidence. I know that some of you, maybe 20% of you, have been in an accident where weather's been an issue. Um, and a few of you may have been in court cases where weather became important. How can you find a CCM if you need one? Um, probably the best place is going to the American Meteorological Society website. The website is listed here. Um, if you can't remember that, it's, there's a lot of M's in there. Uh, you can just search using Google or Yahoo or something for CCM list, and it should come up pretty close to the top of the list. 
And, and we'll, we'll put we'll put this on our website as well uh, under your weather talk. Uh, so Perfect. we'll put that there. Okay. So you can look on the website as well if if you need uh, more information about that. And I think I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions or let Henry take that over. But I hope this has given you a feel for the kind of things that forensic meteorologists do. Thanks, Pam. Yeah, some really interesting cases here. And you don't realize how weather can, can play uh, a role in, in those, uh, those uh, accidents. Um, I, we've got Nolan with us. Nolan, are you there? Do you have a question to start off with? Uh, yes, indeed, I'm there. Thank you very much, Pam. Uh, I'm curious, how do you decide when an a attorney comes to you, how do you decide if you're interested in working on the case? Well, I'm almost always interested because I like the, I like the job. It's a fun thing to do. I mean, it's not for everybody because you have to be able to deal with lawyers. Some lawyers are very nice and others not so much. But first of all, you have to decide, is it something you can even answer? Because occasionally cases come up and there's just not really a good way to answer them using any meteorological information. There's too much that's unknown. There's coincidence or something like that. So you have to figure out if it's if there's even data that are going to support the work. Um, then, you, of course, you have to always also check. There's been at least one case where both sides have contacted me to act as their expert. And you know, generally, the first side to get to you is the winner. But, but that can happen because they're looking for an expert. And there's not necessarily a lot of forensic meteorologists out there. Um, it depends how busy I am and, and other things like that as well. Thanks. Well, Pam, how many how many uh, CCMs are there uh, in the U.S. that are out there? Do you know offhand? Well, I know that the total numbers is now in the 600, but of course some of the early numbers have retired, and some people get them and don't use them. Um, I know in Georgia there's not that many CCMs. Um, some other places where there's a higher concentration of uh, meteorologists, especially retired meteorologists, there tend to be more. For example, near Asheville, North Carolina, where the National Climatic Data Center is, there's quite a number. People retire from the federal government and then they go to work as an expert. Uh, Colorado is another place where there's quite a few because there's there's quite a few National Weather Service and NOAA people that are there. Um, I would say actively, and if you can be a CCM and not do forensic work as well. A lot of the CCMs work on air quality, for example, where they're helping to write environmental impact statements for uh, companies that are building new facilities. And so they wouldn't usually be involved in lawsuits unless somebody goes after the company for polluting. Um, but they often will have CCM degrees as well. So I think in the field of forensics, you know, maybe there's one or two hundred probably that are active. Thanks, Pam. Can you put that last slide back on there so we can just leave that up? Yeah, sure. there we go, folks. If you want to, we'll have this posted on our website later, but if you want to go ahead and take a look, uh, here it is. We're going to take some questions now from our audience, and here's uh, two of them, actually. Uh, one from Winnie wants to know, do you ever have to pay for data? And then um, also Bill asks, have you ever been sued for information you provided? So it's two, two different questions here regarding money. Right. Well, first of all, uh, yes, sometimes you do have to pay for data. Um, most often, it's not the cost of the data itself, but the cost of getting it. The National Climatic Data Center provides a lot of it online for free, but in some states you have to get what they call blue ribbon certified data, which means that NCDC has to print it out and they have to provide paper documentation on where it came from. Um, and and the fanciest have actually a blue ribbon and a, and a gold seal that they put on it to show that it came. Some states are a lot more flexible about that than others. But because it takes somebody time to go through and print out all those copies and do the certification, they do have a charge for that. Um, it's, you can also do, do that when you're using something like a satellite um, data. And a lot of that is just really the cost of acquisition rather than the, the cost of the data itself. Although I think there would certainly be cases where you would probably um, pay for the data. For example, in Georgia, uh, the university runs a, a mesonet of, of local weather stations. And part of their method of getting money to help maintain this network is to charge for people that use the data. And so there would be a charge uh, from some private group like that as well to help pay for some of the data. And you know, it's, it's always a tricky issue because you think weather data should be free, but it, it takes a lot to do quality control for the data. It takes a lot to have somebody sitting there answering the phone and preparing the information 
and mailing it out to you. And so um, it's very common to end up paying for it. Now, a lot of the work I do now, a lot of this data is available for free, and Georgia is not terribly particular about having this blue ribbon certification. Uh, some lawyers are more careful about that than others are. But uh, yeah, it's, it's mo mostly um, paying for the cost of providing the data rather than just strictly for the data, but it, it all kind of works out the same way. Uh, as far as being sued, I have never been sued. Uh, there have been. I, it works kind of the same way as malpractice in doctors. You, you don't follow the right techniques or you don't follow, um, you know, you lie about something in your deposition and it comes out later. Um, I try to behave myself and I, I think I do that pretty well. And so I have not been sued, but but most uh, professional meteorologists do carry some kind of insurance to help cover that, usually some sort of umbrella policy that, that will help to cover that because people sue for lots of reasons, some of which are valid and some of which probably aren't. Um, and so I think if I surveyed the whole group of CCMs, I would probably find some that have been sued, but, but I have not so far. Okay, we've got a couple more questions coming in right now. Uh, here's, here are two other ones, um, a little similar. Uh, have you ever used your knowledge for solving cold cases, Chuck asks, and then uh, Brian from Colorado wants to know, have you ever been contacted to work on a murder case? So both of those questions. Uh, cold cases first. I uh, don't recall that I've ever been asked to work on a cold case. Uh, certainly you could be um, if they were trying to go back and recreate. For example, if they found um, some bones in the wood from somebody that had been there a long time. They might go back and try to figure out, you know, how long that had been there um, by looking at at um, how they were dressed or, or insects or, or something, whether they were above or below a layer of trees and they, there were leaves there or something like that. So it certainly would be possible. I personally have not been. Um, I have been contacted on a couple of murder cases. Uh, as well as some other crime cases. Now, you know, most of the cases I do are civil cases where it's one party suing another, but once in a while you get a case that's involving a crime. Um, I've been asked to talk about formation of dew on packets of cocaine that got thrown out of somebody's pocket, and the issue was how long had they been on the ground um, and how fast can dew form. So that was an issue. Um, another, another question came up when they arrested uh, suspect and they question whether the light was good enough for them to make a positive identification. So I talked about that. Um, in the murder case, uh, I was working with a forensic entomologist, which is someone who studies um, how, how bodies decompose when they're out in the open. And, you know, as, as you might expect, if you, especially if you watch CSI, um, some, a body that sits out in the open for a long time starts to develop some problems with, with flies and, and other insects. And so um, the forensic entomologists have models that depend on what the weather conditions were to, to see how fast those insects appear on the corpse. And so I was working with them to provide weather data for that. I, I guess in the wintertime you do deal with cold cases. In, in, uh, <laughs> to, yeah. Yeah, oh. for slip and falls, yes, that's true. <laughs> there you go, there you go. And, I, and Pam, I was wondering, are you beginning to see any cases from the Georgia snow and ice debacle this, this last winter? Not yet, it's too early. No, now, I have done, I've done cases now uh, recently with the, the floods of 2009, but it usually takes a, a year or two before it really works its way into the court system. So it's probably a little too early for that yet. Yeah, thank you. That was another question, is what is the time lag between incident and when it actually becomes a legal matter? It, it really depends on the case. Some cases are pretty quick. Others, it could be two to three years. I mean, the cases of the, of the hurricanes, because of the number of cases and the fact that Mississippi doesn't have that many courts, some of those were going on for five years or more. Uh, and, you know, as you get more complicated with more parties that are coming in, then that also becomes an issue. Um, but it, it kind of depends on what jurisdiction you're trying to, to go work in. Okay, we're going to take a couple more. Uh, and again, it's funny, these are coming in at like two questions at a time that are related. Here we go. Sharon wants to know how many times a year do you get called in for a case? And then Stanton wants to know what percentage of your time is related to forensic activities and whether the function and the percentages are involved in as a CCM. So one is how many cases and the other is what percentage of your time does this take? 
Uh, the number of cases has varied a lot over time. When I was busy doing all those hurricane cases, I might have you know, 20 or 30 cases at a time that were working. You, you have to understand these cases take a long time. It's, you, you, do the, the, you get the original call, you do the original report, and then several months might go by with no activity at all, and then they might do a deposition, and then another long time period goes by before they might decide to do a trial. So it's not hard to necessarily have quite a few cases at once. Um, they tend to come in streaks when you have some sort of weather event that drives it. I would say, on the average, um, maybe 10 cases a year. And I don't advertise. If I advertise, I could probably be busier. But since I also work full time for the university, um, I, I really don't need the extra work. And then the other question was about the percent of time I do forensics. Um, I have a full time job with the university that involves talking about climate change to farmers, which is really quite different than what I do as a forensic meteorologist. Um, and I do this, the forensic work on the side. And um, since that's more meteorology, there's, there's kind of a natural break there. Um, I would say that most of my CCM work, probably 80% of it right now at least, is, is, is doing testimony. And the others are just occasional cases that come up. Okay, here's, uh, here's another pair of questions uh, dealing this again with uh, money this time. Uh, party wants to know is your is it fee based? Uh, oh, excuse me, is your fee based at all on whether you win a case or lose it? And then Warren asks if you might say something about how one gets connected to a law firm looking for an expert witness, and also what the rate of pay is for something like that. Okay, um, experts are paid not for their testimony, but for their expertise. Um, the expertise should not depend on whether you win or lose because it shouldn't, I mean, CCM or a forensic meteorologist should always strive to, to do the truth, to find the truth, whatever that is. And I've had cases where I, I've had to, I've been hired by a lawyer and I've had to go back to them and say, you do not want to, you do not want to pursue this case because the weather data do not support what you're trying to show. And so they've settled pretty quickly in those cases, but in that case I was, I was really, trying to be true to what the data said. Um, so you should never be paced on, you should never be paid whether or not you win or lose. I, I suppose it's possible, but that really makes you look like what they call a hired gun. In other words, you're, you're being paid to testify in one certain way. And lawyers commonly will ask in court cases, how much of your testimony is for plaintiffs and how much is for defendants? Because if you almost always testify for the plaintiff, then you're perceived of as kind of having a bias that way. And if you're always testifying for the defendants, a bias a different way. It, for me, it works out, it's pretty close to 50-50 over my career. So, so that makes me a little bit more believable because I'm not really sticking with one side or the other. Uh, for getting connected, a lot of, the, probably the number one source of referrals for me is from the American Meteorological Society website. Of course, you know, once a lawyer finds you and they like your work, then they're likely to come back and hire you again. Or sometimes, you know, a lawyer will say, will talk to a colleague and say, I've got this case that involves weather. Have you used anybody in the past? So it's sort of a word of mouth. Um, a number of forensic people do uh, advertising, and some of them will advertise like in, in law journals and things like that. Another thing that has some lawyers have told me will sometimes work is if you go to a big law firm and, and bring in lunch and give them a talk for an hour about what I can do for you as a forensic meteorologist, then you can get business that way. I haven't tried that yet, but uh, I may try that sometime. You just, it works better if you have a large law firm, you know, because then there's more chance there's going to be a case that involves the weather. Um, most engineers, or most CCMs, set their own fee. Um, really kind of depends on the market, and it depends on the, the, on the case. If you're working a really highly specialized case like an air crash where, you know, there's, there's only a few people in the country or maybe even in the world that can do that, you can charge higher fees. And there you might be charging, you know, $400 an hour or something like that. Most people probably don't charge quite that high. Uh, of course, you know, it's still cheap compared to a lawyer. But um, I would say for most people it's probably more in the realm of $200 to $300 an hour, maybe a little higher than that if you're working for one of the firms and you know, you're supporting a bigger infrastructure. But uh, um, just really depends. Some lawyers don't really like to pay that much because they're working with people who don't have a lot of money. And uh, you know, the number of hours that you, that you work on a case also varies quite a bit. 
um, some small cases you can probably do in a couple hours. Uh, if it's a very complicated case, you might be spending 10 or 15 hours to gather all the data and do the analysis, and then also getting paid for doing the deposition and the, and the um, travel to go to a, a court and things like that. And a quick one just came in. Jim, wondered, have you had any problems getting paid by any of the law firms? Are they usually pretty good about? I, I personally have not had any problems. I've talked to a couple other forensic meteorologists who have had trouble. And so they have gone to a, a system of charging what they call a retainer, which means that they pay for like three hours up front. And then if you do more work than that, then they pay you for the amount above that. Um, that way they have some guaranteed money coming in at the start. I haven't gone to that yet, but uh, after talking to them, I'm starting to wonder if I should. Okay, thanks. David in New Hampshire has an interesting question. A any advice for amateur meteorologists, or, like our observers out there who are taking data or collecting data, uh, who are contacted by insurance companies, lawyers, or individuals looking for data concerning an accident? So if somebody comes up to you, you're a Kokoros observer, any advice for them? Uh, in dealing with these guys? You know, I try really hard to keep a wall between the observers and the lawyers, because some observers don't want to be bothered by lawyers at all. Some lawyers are great, some are very obnoxious, and so it kind of depends on your personality. Um, but if, if you want to do that, then you have to be really careful as to speaking only the truth, and uh, you know, it helps if you've got good weather information, if you've got a good site, if you write down, for example, your Kokoraz observations every day, including those zeros, because that's going to make you more trustworthy. It shows that you're, you're following the procedure every day. Um, but I, I think a lot of people just don't want to deal with the whole legal system. Of course, if you're a private individual, you're probably not going to be getting paid for it either. You're just going to go because you're interested in the weather and you think you have some information to contribute. So I, I think it's really up to individuals whether or not they want to go down that route. And our privacy policy protects all volunteers from being contacted directly, but my heavens, we have had attorneys asking to contact volunteers and we have had to run interference for them. Yeah. But some of our volunteers really, really want to be contacted. So I, I will often contact the observer and ask them, do they want to be contacted pertaining to a particular incident and case? And some of them said, oh, yes, please. Uh, Bill writes in, he says that he sees there are no CCMs in Wyoming. Is it beneficial to a, to a CCM's credibility if they can say they lived in a certain state for a length of time? Uh, yeah, I would. I would think it would. If you if you know the local climate conditions and the local weather conditions, then I think you know if if you were up on the stand and you were explaining, you know how how do you come to know the weather in Wyoming? You say, well, I lived there for five or ten years. It gives you some more credibility because then you understand local conditions. And and most lawyers want to ha want to hire an expert that's local. They don't want to hire somebody from across the country because then it looks like they're bringing in a hired gun. And so they would want to hire somebody that was in the local community as much as possible. It's also cheaper because then you don't have to pay all the travel costs. Okay, Pam, looks like this is our last question uh, for the day here. Uh, and Alan writes in and wants to know, have you had cases where climate change was a consideration, uh, maybe where people wanted to uh, quantify future risk? You know, climate change is something that has not, it has just this year entered the court system. Um, and I, there's a, some cases, I think, in Illinois where uh, some insurance companies are refusing to pay because they said people should have taken climate change into account. But really, climate change is something that's a very long-term thing. Right now, uh, most legal cases, you'd be just looking at year-to-year -year variability, and you probably couldn't say anything about the impacts of climate change on that short term. Now, you know, if, if you go down 50 years from now and uh, say a, a dam that was designed to hold a certain amount of water uh, bursts, then you might say, was that dam designed correctly, um, considering that the climate is not changing. But the way that most um, building codes are written, it's assuming that the climate is not changing. And so that's usually, um, you build it at a specific time under a specific set of building codes. And I, it's, I think it's likely to happen in the future. It really hasn't happened yet, and I think it'd be really hard to prove in court at this point. 
Well, Pam, thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. We, we really enjoyed this talk. Uh, learned a lot about what uh, what a CCM does and, and hopefully uh, if someone needs one in the future they can go to that list and, uh, and and be able to contact someone okay that sounds great yeah well thanks again Pam I'm, we're gonna can, we're gonna close out our talk today and, and I want to invite everyone out there to join us for our next Cocoros weather talk webinar that's going to be on Thursday September 11th the same time as this one. And this webinar will feature Louisville, Louisville uh, Kentucky's National Weather Service Forecast Office, boy, it's a mouthful, Chief Meteorologist John Gordon. And John's going to talk about the day in the life of a National Weather Service Forecast Office. I, I bet many folks will find that interesting, what goes on during the day, uh, the challenges they have, and so forth. So uh, we'll have that up on the web to sign up for shortly. Uh, be sure to join us for that. And then before you sign off today, please take our brief survey that will pop up on your screen. That will help our evaluators know how we're doing with these. Uh, this is our 33rd, so we've done a lot of uh, Kokoros Weather Talk webinars, uh, and uh, we're glad you guys uh, like them and are continuing to attend. So until next time, this is Henry Regis for the rest of the Kokoros team saying goodbye and uh, have a great afternoon. <laughs>